nothing but abundance. One need only reach out. Welcome to the Green Lodge. Remember what it was like to read the Grimm's fairy tales as a child? How about as an adult? Have you revisited them lately? There's definitely a hidden darkness that doesn't quite hit as hard until you've got a few years under your belt. Things like in Cinderella, the glass slipper overflowing with blood after one of the stepsisters cuts off one of her toes to fit it in. Then the next sister cuts off her heel. Or with Hansel and Gretel, that Hansel was using the skeletal fingers from previous victims to trick the witch into thinking he's not gaining weight. These are not the whimsical adventures Disney sold us, nor are they the clean and simple fairy tales that have been endlessly regurgitated as children's books. The original tales had a point, and they didn't care if they traumatized you in the process. And in that same vein, I'd like to introduce you to Oz Perkins, Gretel and Hansel. Gretel and Hansel takes a much more mystical approach to the material, inspired heavily by occult imagery. I would definitely call this low fantasy, like The Witcher, where there's magic but it requires blood and guts to pull it off properly, and everything is just covered in the slayer of grime. Dreams play an important role in how the story unfolds, often alluding to things Gretel can't prove are true, but just having the implication completely changes her outlook. But before we delve into the meat of this particular tale, I wanted to thank my patron, Chris Markinson, Stormy OK, Bryce Cleek, Catherine C., and Larry Quarterwitz. Thank you guys so much for keeping me going. And more are always welcome. If you like my spin on these type of movies, consider joining my Patreon for as little as $1 an episode. So stay a while, won't you? Who knows, you might even enjoy it. I only hope you're hungry. Oh, my name is Justin D. Hurd. I'm all sewn up. Are you ready to go? I would like if I may, to take you on a strange journey. It begins with a beautiful girl in a pretty pink cap. Honestly, she's a bit of a bastard, you know, deal with the darkness and all that jazz. She ended up being a fortune teller that a scourge on her community. She even killed her own father, broke the neck of her horse with her mind before being given back to the evil creature that had both saved and transformed her. All this to say, Beware of gifts. How very tales from the crypt of them. <laughs> this is a setup for the imagery and overall tone of Gretel and Hansel. That of an uncaring world where magic, at least the evil variety, does exist. It is referenced multiple times throughout by the siblings, mostly for its message then. Nothing is given without something else being taken away. Now onto our sweet little chitlins. Every bit the delicacy that that name implies. Chitlins are pigs, pee pee, pigs, stomach. That is disgusting! <laughs> you ain't pig guts. We start out with Gretel getting dolled up as naturally as she can to try and take the burden off her family by becoming a maid to the local lord. Unfortunately, she finds out rather quickly that that won't be her primary duty. Have you kept your maidenhood? Are you intact? She nopes the fuck out of there and then has to face her mother. It doesn't go well. <laughs> this is where the more fantastical elements come into play. The kids are forced out into the wilderness and probably find an abandoned shack. They make themselves at home laying down in a makeshift bed, not even questioning why there's a bed there or where its owner might be. True to form for these type of tales. Only for them to be attacked by a previously hidden and stock still creature that one can only assume is a vampire or some sort of zombie. It 
attacks them, screaming all the while, before being promptly executed by a traveling huntsman. That huntsman takes care of them for the night before sending them out to find foresters for their new home. During their travels, they just so happen to get lost and stumble across some mushrooms. The griddle asks if they're safe and says that it sounds like they want her to eat them. I bet you can see where this is going. They're gonna trip balls. <laughs> <laughs> After their psychedelic detour, they trip over the witch's house, and here is where the rest of the movie takes place, as you might expect. Rather than breaking down the minutia of their interactions, here are the broad strokes. Played by the exquisite Alice Creek, the witch comes off as unassuming, despite how off-putting she can be. While Gretel is initially suspicious, Hansel is more than happy to make this place his home. But why should we see a problem? Something behind or under? Something hidden? Because the big bad world is what it is. We're safe now from the world. Isn't that what you want? However, he is quickly overcome by the witch, with a constantly repeating refrain playing in his head as he sharpens the endless supply of saws. The thought in your head is go look in the shed. You'll find saws to be sharpened for the bones of the dead. What eats with its teeth, but never feels bad. At the same time, the witch begins to teach Gretel how to use her inherent powers. If only she'd sacrifice what is most dear to her. Once Gretel starts to get a taste of the witch's magic, she stops being as practical. At one point, even her brother becomes the voice of reason, trying to remind Gretel that You always say there aren't any gifts in this world, that nothing is given without something taken away. So tell me this, what is she taking? But it's her dreams that break the illusion. a lot of the weirder atmospheric sequences from the replicating witches in the forest to Gretel seeing a vision of where their food actually comes from. You could argue that the horror in a lot of these scenes are cheap, loud noise jump scares. However, I think it adds more to the oppressive atmosphere. The film's peak moment of horror comes from the first basement dream with a rising chorus of dead children warning her away. is unsettling, has a great building score, and totally plays with the Orofsky-style occult imagery. Actually, now that I think about it, the movie owes a lot to Alejandro Jodorowsky. Alejandro Jodorowsky is known as the father of the Midnight movie. His third film, El Topo, couldn't find mass distribution, but instead found its footing in America at the Elgin Theater in New York City. There were so few real Midnight hits. The first one was El Topo. The whole Midnight phenomena, uh actually started in the fall of 1970 with uh, Alejandro Jodorowsky's El Topo. Where it would play as a midnight movie over the course of several months and caught the attention of John Lennon. I'm gonna be sad. Yeah, that one. Lennon helped boost the Acid Western's profile and got the Beatles' Apple Corps to distribute it in the United States. He also helped get the funding for Jodorowsky's next film, The Holy Mountain, which was supposed to star George Harrison, but George was very resistant to a nude scene where he would have his anus cleaned. And Jodorowsky stood by his principles and lost on having one of the biggest musicians in his picture, as well as tons of money for the film. Yes, yes. <laughs> you know when I make The Holy Mountain? Uh, George Harrison wanted to act the actor. Want to act that. He said to me, I will do it. I read the script, I like it. But this, this little this, uh, moment, I will not do it. What moment? When I am there and then I show my asshole there, they clean my asshole with a, an hippot hippopotamus near, I will not show my, my ass. No, I cannot do it. I say, but it's fantastic lesson for the ego. The ego. If you are an actor, you are an artist, show yourself completely. Be naked. 
Personally, I'm not a fan of El Topo. Well, I actually love the first half of it where it centers on the gunslinger out to kill gods. But the second half completely lost. However, the Holy Mountain is damn near perfect to me. I'm sure it doesn't hurt that one of my favorite bands, Black Light Burns, did an alternate soundtrack to the first 40 minutes of the film called Lotus Island. Anyway, Yodorovsky's films are psychedelic experiences that lean heavily into spirituality and early pop visuals that include sacred geometry, Jewish mysticism, and manifestations of the terror. All in an effort to transcend me, and has inspired everyone from Marilyn Manson to Nicholas Lennon Raffin. He regularly employed psychedelics while creating his movies, including using them on his actors. There's even an amazing documentary called Yodorovsky's Doom, which revealed he was key in bringing together most of the talent that went on to create Alien in the aftermath of his failed Dune adaptation. You can even see his influence in Ridley Scott's recent Alien reimaginings. At that point, I immediately keyed into Yodorovsky's shadow being draped over Gretel and Hansel. The way the witch is dressed, similar to the alchemist in the Holy Mountain. The way he uses triangles to draw the eye. And even the designs of the witch's house. Specifically, this shot with Gretel looking through the peephole into the house. Like Nicholas Winning Ref and Perkins' use of color and dream logic, feel like something directly from Yodorovsky's catalog. While I wouldn't say that Alejandro managed to build that creepy feeling to the same level, Gretel and Hansel still fits the mold. I wanted to embrace the feeling of fairy tales which are inherently scary. Osgood Perkins is one of my favorite newer directors, despite him being in his mid-40s at the release of Gretel and Hansel. He's the son of Anthony Perkins and had a whole career as an actor long before he was finally able to put together his feature film debut, The Black Hood's Daughter. That film, which features both Karen Shipka and Emma Roberts, is a creepy meditation on loneliness that actually makes you feel bad when the possession is broken by the local priest. His follow-up, I Am the Pretty Thing That Lives in the House, was a Netflix horror film that leaned heavily into gothic horror. It's inspired by films where the people are as haunted, if not more so, than the location. It's a slow burn about obsession and losing your place in the world. If you enjoyed The Haunting of Bly Manor, this one is worthy of your attention. It's definitely not for everyone, but I thoroughly enjoyed its somber tone and beautiful atmosphere. That being said, I'm super hyped for the release of Gretel and Hansel. <laughs> Oz had proven that he had an interesting outlook on horror films, and this was so drenched in atmosphere and gorgeous visuals that I couldn't help but be entranced by it. The detail I loved, especially on repeated viewings, is the kids' reaction to the first feast they indulge in. Hansel had no reservations. While keeping with the central thesis of the film, Gretel was suspicious of gifts. However, her hunger eventually wins out and she tenaciously eats. While we don't see them stuff themselves, instead we cut to the aftermath and their stomachs revolting against them. At this point in the story, we do not know where the food comes from, though we are of course suspicious knowing the original story. However, when we learn that the food has been transformed from the corpses of the other children she slaughtered, it makes perfect sense that their bodies would not process the transmogrified rotten flesh. One of my favorite scenes is when the witch returns from her trip. After Hansel has disappeared, Gretel is told by the witch that she is leaving because it's not regular that nature calls out to me, but when she does, I try to answer. She asks for tea and some leftover food. Up until this point, we've seen tables full of food, as well as a dream that uncovered the mystery behind how the witch supplies the feast. Regardless of whether or not it's a dream, Gretel has a choice here, and it's interesting what she ends up doing. When the witch arrives home, she is greeted by an empty table, all except for a single bowl and her tea. The bowl has some questionable food that, well, no one could quite identify that greenish brownish stuff. Personally, it makes more sense to me that it isn't food at all, and instead, now, stick with me here. It's fecal matter. It, it, it's shit. Just think about it. Gretel here is completely suspicious of the witch and whether or not her dreams actually exist. Hansel's missing by this point and she knows about both the witch's and her own powers. But she doesn't know to what depths of depravity the witch would go to. The last time she saw the witch, they had this exchange. Fix me a cup of tea for when I'm back. That'd be nice. And leave the thought out. 
you know, and to light something later. It suggests that the witch is letting her guard slip. She's asking for some comfort she usually withholds from. And she comes home to a bowl of literal shit. And she just chomps down on it. And then we get the iconic blonde ponytail pulling that made up so much of the movie's marketing. At this point, we know that the beautiful food that's been displayed is made out of the guts and limbs of children that the witch had previously slaughtered. For the normal amount of food the witch had been making, Gretel would have had to throw out so much of the feast to make her eat that specific bowl. And the witch doesn't even notice that it isn't real food. That's how far gone she is. I even sent out the image of the bowl to my followers, and no one could quite figure out what it was. Some thought it was bunt cake, Brussels sprouts, but none of it really fit. From behind the scenes stuff I've read, it turns out it was actually sausage, but that doesn't actually mean that's what it was meant to be in the fiction of the universe. It might be nothing more than headcanon, but it just makes too much sense for it to be anything else. Now, the only real misstep in this film is that they employ a Terrence Malicky vibe throughout with close-ups on the characters' faces as they walk, Gretel has the only internal monologue, and it feels like an afterthought included after some production notes. But a lot of her thoughts are more exposition for the audience than anything that really adds to the story. Fairy tales have a funny way of getting into your head. I don't remember where I was, or when, that I first heard the story of the beautiful child in her little pink cap just feels like I've always known it. There is a late movie pivot that makes sense, but it also is just enough of a weird twist that it feels like it was meant to hit a lot harder than it does. Throughout, we reference the story of the beautiful girl and her little pink cat, that nothing given is ever free. From the way the witch is dressed, it seems clear that she is the young girl the darkness has corrupted. However, when Gretel finally attempts to betray the witch, it is revealed that the child we've been told about was not the witch, but instead her daughter which she ate in order to claim her dark powers. So hungry was I to realize my own powers, I hardly even chewed. It's a small change that reframes the entire story. It makes more sense that the witch is a child that grew up to become this evil thing, with everything we've been told up to that point. For a movie that already had a lot of people not liking it, this subtle change was enough to throw many off. It does fit with the story they're trying to tell about cutting off emotional ties so that you can be the best version of yourself. It just so happens that the best version of this villain is someone who wants to do nothing but eat children. That little boy is your poison. All that is left is to make him delicious. You can't. My dear, I can't remember a time when there was anything else I cared to do. Look, this is one of those films that is either a love it or hate it affair. When you come through the reviews, it tends to be either ones or tens, which for some reason seem to be my favorite films. <sighs> However, one of the recurring themes in those reviews is that people didn't want this particular take on the story, and instead wanted the wacky horror hijinks of Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters. So you might ask yourself, why are people latching on to the escapist fantasy of witch hunters as opposed to the old school horror of Grimm's fairy tales? I mean, it just comes down to taste. While I'm a fan of Gemma Arterton, that was not enough to get me into witch hunters. The film is honestly just not for me. I'm not here to disparage the film, I just don't enjoy films that are loud. Hansel and Gretel Witch Hunters is a combination of a lot of interesting ideas that help fill out the action horror film with a nice addition of comedy to the proceedings but it is also gross, just to be gross. The curse of hunger for crawling things. I fucking hate that one. That was awesome. I wanted to bring it up because of just how many people I've seen lamenting that Gretel and Hansel is not Hansel and Gretel witch hunters. But to compare the two is missing the forest for the trees. They are coming to the material from completely different places. The intention of witch hunters seems to be to make a goofy but bloody version of Hansel and Gretel in line with other fantasy films of the day. Whereas Gretel and Hansel is built to be a faithful interpretation of the original story. There is little to no humor in the film. It is meant to be grim dark. 
It's not the movie's fault that you wanted something else from it. But that is what I'm seeing in most of the bad takes. People wanted something similar to Witch Hunters, and this is not the movie for them. One of the things that definitely struck me about this film is <sighs> the heaviness of it. It feels like it should be a straight up hard R, with the witch's overbearing feeling pressing down on you throughout. I honestly have no idea how they got a PG-13, or why they'd even want to pursue it. I can't imagine a 16-year-old Dubro seeing this film and being happy with that decision. I'd love to be proven wrong, but the reviews seem to bear that out. So where does this leave us? Gretel and Hansel takes all the things I've loved from A24's more aesthetic horror and applies it to a reimagined Hansel and Gretel storyline featuring witches and some pretty ghastly imagery. It has quickly found its place on my top movies to recommend. It has its caveats, yes, but the last 30 minutes are unimpeachable, and it doesn't release its hold on me until the credits roll. What did you think of this film? Are you a fan of Oz Perkins' other movies, or is this your first one? I'd love to hear what you think, especially since I definitely write hard for this one. As always, you can find me on Twitter at Justin D. Heard or on my website, justindheard.com. Please consider supporting us on Patreon like these fine people. Chris Markinson, Stormy OK, Bryce Cleek, Catherine C., and Larry Quarterwitz. If you want to support the channel, you can do so for as little as $1 per video. You get access to the videos early, scripts, as well as commentaries for each video. I've got that two-hour Hellraiser series retrospective in the chamber for when we hit 50 patrons. If you have any suggestions for future episodes, hit me up on Twitter. I'm on there more than any other social media site, and I'm always looking to talk. Thank you for sticking to the end of the episode. It's been an absolute pleasure entertaining you, but it's getting late. I'm all sewn up. Close the door behind you.